as, as I was introduced, right, I'll be presenting the, our paper, Identifying Adoption or Rejection of Misinformation Targeting COVID-19 Vaccines in Twitter Discourse by me and my advisor, Dr. Sandahara Bajiu. Um, you know, we, we both work out of the uh, Human Language Technology Research Institute at the University of Texas at Dallas. So just to provide a little overview for this talk, you know, I'm going to go through this outline here. So first, I'm kind of just going to talk about the problem of misinformation, which many people on this call have already discussed, you know, it's very serious. And then also talking about um, this Twitter data set that we have developed specifically to target misinformation, some of the benefits of this data set versus FEMI and other types of data sets, um, identifying stance towards misinformation, which is the goal of this research paper through attitude consistency, experimental results, and then our conclusions. So kind of diving right into it, as other people in this call have discussed, misinformation or fake news, however you want to cast it, is a very serious problem, especially these days on social media. It can be very impactful in political events. It can be very impactful um, specifically for the COVID-19 pandemic. We've seen a lot of COVID-19 misinformation, but specifically, we've also seen a lot of COVID-19 vaccine misinformation, which is where we kind of dive into in this research, um, which is you know, a very important issue because it's caused a lot of deaths. Uh, misinformation is very clearly linked to a reduction in trust in public health uh, areas. The research is very clear there. So we've kind of targeted that as the issue and looked at the problem of misinformation of, you know, first, you know, we want to recognize whether a post contains some misconceptions, some reference to a conspiracy theory or faulty reasoning, find instances where people discuss this types of misinformation, and then identify their stance towards that misinformation. So, you know, some types of misinformation are easily debunked and widely debunked, while others are widely accepted, propagated, and discussed. So acceptance or adoption and rejection or, you know, debunking, stuff like that, this is very important to understand for misinformation. Um, some examples of misinformation for the COVID-19 vaccines here for this specific misinformation target that the COVID-19 vaccines might render pregnancies risky. We see, you know, in this first example, this user is essentially comparing the, you know, perceived potential risk of the COVID-19 vaccine with their, uh, you know, also perceived fake risk of COVID and whether it will cause issues, right? So they kind of provide this dichotomy you have to choose between these two things when obviously that's not true and the vaccines you know don't have any um, side effects for the pregnant whereas the other example the tweet the person discusses whether um, like the actual benefits of taking the vaccine when you're pregnant and linking to a specific study about pregnant women taking the COVID-19 vaccines and how it's been helpful. So obviously understanding the differences between the acceptance and rejection here is important for public health officials because there's no reason to intervene on users who reject misinformation. We wanna target those users who accept misinformation for further you know, interventions and, and attempts in public health to convince these users that the vaccines or other you know, public measures are important. Um, so that, that's kind of the problem of misinformation. Let's dive into the data set. So FEMI and you know, some of these other data sets are very great for identifying misinformation kind of from scratch, from no knowledge, right? But from a public health official's perspective, if we know certain misinformation topics, certain things that people are talking about, uh, the question really more becomes, how do we find instances of that on Twitter or other social media platforms? And then how do we find stances towards that on those platforms? So, you know, towards that goal, we built this COVAX Lies Twitter data set, which is a, you know, decently sized few thousand tweet data set of misinformation targets that are known that we identified either through um, uh, you know, public health officials or through using this question answering approach, which you can look at in the paper. Um, then we collected a large number of tweets which evoke these myths, which means that the misinformation target is present in the tweet, but we don't know whether they agree or disagree or have no stance. And then we also developed a taxonomy of misinformation, working closely with public health researchers to kind of categorize this misinformation that we found about the COVID-19 vaccine so that we can analyze it um, you know, more beneficially for public health officials. Also, the data set is public available. There are some links. You can also find that in the paper. Um, so in terms of the taxonomy, we developed this, you know, very rich taxonomy of misinformation going from whether the vaccines are safe to the ingredients to alternatives all the way to whether there's some sort of conspiracy about the vaccines being, um, you know, having information concealed and then 
at the high level being the theme, then the second highest level being the concern, and then these are linked to specific misinformation targets. So this helped us therefore do kind of a high level analysis when we built our data set, which was what are the most commonly discussed misinformation targets on Twitter from our discovery, um, you know, mostly being whether the vaccine's unsafe, whether there's adverse events, then the ingredients, and then you know, less and less and less as that pie chart goes around on the left there. And then on the right, we also identify, okay, after finding instances of this misinformation, what do people accept? What do people reject? And what are people neutral about, right? So there's a lot of adoption on Twitter about alternatives to the COVID-19 vaccines and, and whether the vaccines have been tested properly and the ingredients, whereas there's more of a rejection, there's more debunking about the effect of the COVID-19 vaccine on the immune system, whether the vaccine is effective or not, or whether it's necessary or not, right? So this allows public health officials to think about how they might wanna to respond to these types of issues. Um, so, you know, obviously this is very useful from an analysis perspective, but we want to go further. We want to identify stance automatically through some learned system. And the approach we took was what we call attitude consistency. So the idea of attitude consistency is essentially um, central to our approach. We might have some misinformation target that a tweet has some particular stance towards, but that tweet shouldn't be considered in isolation. And I'm not just talking about like retweets and stuff like that. I'm saying you know, some misinformation target that the vaccines maybe render pregnancies risky, we want to look at all of the tweets that might have some stance towards that misinformation target. So from a more semantic perspective, let's look at all of the tweets which have an accept stance, all of the tweets which have a reject stance, because those tweets, those tweets that all discuss the same misinformation target and have some stance, also implicitly either agree or disagree with each other, right? So those tweets would agree if they both have the same stance towards that misinformation target, but they would disagree if they both have a different stance. So both accepting and rejecting if they both share that same stance towards the misinformation target, they would agree implicitly with each other. Whereas if one accepts and the other rejects that misinformation target, they would disagree and you know, vice versa, right? So this is this concept of attitude consistency, which allows us to look at these tweets in the bottom left here as this large graph of semantic agreement, disagreement, maybe no stance, but that's left out in this graph, right? All towards the same misinformation target. And we can start to draw sort of these relationships between tweets of agreement and disagreement, which allows us to look at the question of whether a new tweet, something that's you know just coming in hot off the presses from Twitter, does it agree or does it disagree with all of these tweets that we already have known stance and agreement and disagreement for, right? So this allows us to compare sort of, you know, almost contrastively, right? We can compare a new tweet with all of the other tweets that we have and identify what are the relationships between those tweets and this new tweet, right? So this lets us predict stance essentially without needing to just you know, directly predict the stance. We can also look at all of these examples. So, you know, obviously we can formalize it. We, we have this in the paper where we take these two relation types of agreement and disagreement. We look at all the sort of different situations that you can have with, it, with agreement and disagreement. We can, you know, we consider the situations that preserve attitude consistency, right? So if two tweets agree, have the same stance, they agree. If they have different stances, they disagree. And this allows us to, again, build this really large misinformation knowledge graph. And you know, using that knowledge graph, we can train knowledge graph embedding approaches that allow us to predict these relationships between tweets, right? So um, that's attitude consistency, but let's take it further, right? So if we have this ability to produce uh, links between tweets, we have the ability to predict agreement and disagreement between tweets, we can start to ask the question, well, how many jumps, how many you know, formal jumps can we take from one tweet to another? So say we have one tweet that's labeled as acceptance of a certain misinformation target, we could predict that that agrees with another tweet, and then we could predict that tweet agrees with another tweet. And then by sort of the transitive property of these relations, we can therefore infer that both of those tweets have an accept stance, right? So think transitivity in terms of, you know, if A implies B, B implies C, then A implies C. We can take these links that have many jumps, and this allows us to inform our uh, relationship predictions, which also then therefore inform our stance predictions. So we can take you know, as, as long a chain as we want, and we can help 
use that chain to inform our final prediction for that tweet that could be you know multiple steps removed from the original annotated tweet. So this allows us to use a really small sort of seed graph of tweets which have a couple um, stances annotated, you know, just a few to make much larger predictions on a wider, you know, data set, which is very beneficial for us. We don't want to have to look at a ton of labeled examples, right? Um, so how do we do this? Well, our goal, again, in this uh, approach is not to look at the graph, you know, like retweet graph and stuff like that, but to look at the content, very much focus on the content of these tweets, right? So we take the misinformation target, we take tweet X, and then we might take tweet Y, we put them all through COVID Twitter BERT. This is all trained end to end. And then, you know, we take that output of COVID Twitter BERT, the CLS embedding or something, and put it through a linear layer to create an agreement and a disagreement relation type for the misinformation target. Those are knowledge embeddings. And then we will have some tweet knowledge embedding for TEX and TEY. So this gives us uh, essentially what we need to train a knowledge embedding model on some knowledge embedding scoring function, which, you know, there's a very rich history of training knowledge embedding models, but this allows us to encode that knowledge using the actual, you know, text of these tweets and the text of the misinformation target. Um, so that's kind of the outline of attitude consistency and the approach we took uh, going into some more details here, you know, experimental results. We take our COVAX lies test collection, we perform our attitude consistency with all of these, you know, bells and whistles. Um, we try out lots of different knowledge embedding approaches, trans E, trans D, you know, all of these here, right? And we found that we actually perform pretty well when we do this, right? So with trans MS and attitude consistency scoring, this transitive attitude consistency scoring, we were to go from 83.7 macro F1 to 87.1 macro F1. Um, and this is improving on our, pr our previous research where we use lexical, emotional, and semantic graph attention networks with BERT. So this, this definitely adds a lot to this approach, which also obviously includes looking at all of those other examples, but it is very useful for us. And you'll also see that most of our performance gains were in the reject F1 score going from you know 80.7 uh, to 85.6. So understanding rejection is very important for us, especially from a public health perspective so that we can ignore those people who obviously are already on our side or on public health side in rejecting misinformation. And then, you know, we, we analyzed our performance across our taxonomy, which we built for this data set, right? So we were able to look at uh, where are we performing well, where are we not performing well, are we performing better on adoption or rejection? Um, and, you know, as you can see, there's kinds that tend to be a trend where if we perform better on adoption, we perform a little worse on rejection. But you see there's some, you know, dramatic drops, for example, for information concealed. There's so few people on Twitter uh, debunking these conspiracy theories that, you know, there's information concealed about the COVID-19 vaccine. There's so few debunking that we just don't have enough data to do well on that rejection class there. So, you know, we do well on adoption because there's a lot of examples. Um, but yeah, so that's that's essentially the overview. That's that's the approach we took. That's how we, you know, were able to accomplish what we wanted to accomplish. We found that attitude consistency provided a very strong signal for stance detection, better than lexical, emotional, and semantic knowledge alone. And moreover, that the knowledge embedding approach um, with the transitivity encapsulated misinformation discourse on Twitter, which was able to explain why our results were much more promising in this in this way, right? So this, this is really useful for public health officials to, you know, do profiling on Twitter to understand, you know, what types of misinformation is understood, where trust is eroded and stuff like that. So thank you very much. Uh, that's the end of my talk. If we have any questions, you know, I'll be open. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. It's really interesting. Are there questions from the audience? Ah, yeah, I think. Uh, yes, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I, I, I had a, qu a confusion regarding the attitude consistency uh, aspect sure. that you had. Um, are you considering that the uh, that a user has a consistent stance on something over time uh, because that does not account for a stance change due to persuasion in say political in misinformation also i'm confused uh, are you assuming that users are uh, uh, vulnerable to uh, all kinds of topics uh, if they have like if they have one stance of reject or uh, accept uh, on one topic that they're more likely to have that same stance across topics this is no. just confusing. 
Please. Those, those are great questions. Thank you. Yeah. So for the second question, just to immediately, you know, remove that. No, we're, we're not making any assumptions about users believing one. In fact, it would be the opposite. We very much want these to be separate because from a public health perspective, we want to be able to intervene on people based on very specific misinformation that they concern themselves with, right? So no, it's the opposite. Each one of these misinformation topics gets its own knowledge graph. So they're completely separate from each other. Um, going back to the first question, uh, yes, there is a room here for changing of stance towards misinformation. Um, this specific paper doesn't consider the time dimension, um, but as well, we're not really doing user profiling yet in, in this paper, right? So we're just looking at this data set that we constructed, and we're saying if user A has a tweet which agrees with this misinformation topic and user B has a tweet which agrees with this misinformation topic, then they both implicitly agree with each other on that misinformation topic. No, you know, nothing outside of that and no time dimension there, but you're completely correct, you know, in profile, we would want to take that into account and we would also, you know, again, we're not making any assumptions across misinformation. Thank you so much for the talk. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. No, thanks for the question. Um, any other question? We would have time for a very short one. Otherwise, I would have a short question. Uh, do you think, so you said in, uh, you previously did classical stance detection with lexical, emotional, and semantic sure. um, uh, yeah, features. Do you think your, classif uh, your, your taxonomy could help there as well? So maybe split the uh, misinformation targets up into, yeah. Yeah, that, that's a really good question. I think that there's a lot of room here to expanding this knowledge graph. Sorry, I'm moving around so much. Expanding this knowledge graph from just agreement and disagreement relations, maybe considering agreement across themes or across concerns, right, as a relation type in this graph, that which would then implicitly use this really nice taxonomy actually in the training. In, in this case, we only use this for analysis, but using this as part of the actual training process, I think would be very smart. So yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you.